Chapter 2 Some Fundamental Constitutional Principles of the Militia of the Several States The Constitution expressly provides the means by which we the people ourselves can and must exercise the power of the sword, namely, the militia of the several states. The importance of this subject is reflected in the several parts of the Constitution that deal with it. Most obviously of all, the Second Amendment sets out the finding of historical fact and conclusion of supreme law, binding everyone throughout the United States that, quote, a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state, and on that basis commands that, quote, the right of the free people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The significance of this finding cannot be overemphasized, for this is the one and only time the Constitution explicitly cites and relies upon a principle of political philosophy and the cumulative experience of American history, that, quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state to justify a right of the people to keep and bear arms, and a corresponding disability of the government that it shall not be infringed. The means for assuring the deployment of a well-regulated militia in each state appear in the first instance in the power and duty of Congress to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States so that the militia can perform their function of guarantors of the security of a free state, the Constitution delegates to Congress the power and the duty in the first instance to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions, to enable them to carry out their mandate to execute the laws of the Union, the Constitution places the militia pro tempore under the President of the United States, who shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. This enables the President to exercise his own power and fulfill his own duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. The constitutional authority of the militia to suppress insurrections and repel invasions can be invoked by the United States when they exercise their power and discharge their duty to guarantee to every state in this Union a Republican form of government, and to protect each of them against invasion and against domestic violence. And, the Bill of Rights further recognizes the special position of the militia in its allowance that, quote, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the militia, when in actual service in time of war or public danger. More specifically, in mandating that a well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, the Second Amendment self-evidently guarantees the right of the people to keep and bear arms for the purpose of maintaining a well-regulated militia in each of the several states, so that by the efforts of such militia, the security of a free state can be preserved throughout the Union. Arguably, the amendment also implicitly secures an even more expansive right to keep and bear arms for individual self-defense under any and all circumstances. For as Blackstone made clear, self-defense, as it is justly called the primary law of nature, so it is not, neither can it be in fact taken away by the law of society. Plainly, however, that is not the amendment's express purpose. For in strict legal analysis, personal self-defense is a privilege, which one may choose to assert and exercise or not, as they alone deem fit. An aggressor has no right to claim that their victim has no right to defend themselves. But the victim labors under no personal duty to do so. 
In any community organized on Anglo-American principles, however, everyone shares the same legal duty, which the government may enforce against him, to participate in defense of that society against aggressors and lawbreakers. This is not a matter of personal choice. No one may assert a legal privilege or immunity of absolute pacifism or conscientious objection, although the society may grant such a privilege or immunity as a matter of its legislative grace. Under the Constitution, this duty of communal self-defense requires all able-bodied adult individuals to serve in the well-regulated militia. To ensure the fulfillment of this duty, particularly against aggression and law-breaking by domestic usurpers and tyrants, the Constitution recognizes an absolute right of the people to keep and bear arms, and a corresponding duty of all public officials not to infringe upon that right. The Founders wrote the Second Amendment as they did, so as to emphasize that each individual citizen's duty to keep and bear arms precedes, explains, justifies, and directs the primary exercise of the right, and in and of itself constitutes an absolute limitation on the power of public officials. Embodying as it does a social duty, the Second Amendment neither assigns nor restricts the right to keep and bear arms to only part of the people. Rather, the amendment implicitly defines a well-regulated militia of a free state as consisting of the people as a whole, all of whom must themselves personally keep and bear arms, or assist others to do so in order to provide the security, and through that security, safeguard the freedom of their state. To be perfectly accurate, the role and substance of American legal history and constitutional analysis needs to be taken into account here. There having been no amendment of the Constitution with respect to the militia, except implicitly to expand their composition, what the phrase, the militia of the several states means today, is precisely what it meant in the late 1700s. For, quote, we are bound to interpret the Constitution in light of the law as it existed at the time it was adopted, according to the case Maddox versus the United States, 1895. In that era, everyone knew perfectly well that the militia of the several states were the militia then actually extant in every state. These were the only militia familiar to the Founding Fathers and their forebears that had existed in every one of the original thirteen colonies and independent states for some 150 years prior to the ratification of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the organization and operation of which had been mandated in linguistically similar, quite often identical terms in scores of militia acts enacted throughout the country during that period. This statutory record provides unambiguous and conclusive proof of the principles, powers, privileges, and practices of the militia of the several states. In the pre-constitutional era, the full duty to keep and bear arms defined in the colonial and state militia acts applied only to all able-bodied adult free males, but never to free women and usually not to male slaves. Adult free women, however, were often required by law to provide firearms, ammunition, and accoutrements for their minor sons and their male apprentices and servants enrolled in the militia. So, in this limited sense, free women, too, were subject to a duty to keep arms. And in times of crisis, armed women who organized themselves in their own military companies were not unknown. The duty to keep and bear arms carried with it an implicit right to do so, without which fulfillment of the duty would have been problematic or even impossible. So, the people to whom appertained the right and duty to keep and bear arms, in relationship to the militia, consisted of all adult free males, for all purposes, and certain adult women, for some purposes. 
Moreover, no statute in that era ever generally disbarred any free men or women from themselves possessing firearms in their homes or from carrying them abroad for any legitimate reason unrelated to the militia. Today, with the abolition of slavery and the emancipation of adult women, the people, for purposes of both the right and the duty to keep and bear arms in and for the militia, encompasses essentially all adult Americans not disqualified by some physical or mental disability or criminal sentence for a commission of a constitutionally recognized crime. Although in the nature of things, except in the most extreme circumstances, the service required of women will be less onerous than that required of men. Besides always being subject to scrutiny through history's lens, the Constitution, just as any other statute, must be read as an entirety, consistently interrelating all of its provisions, so that when the same term which has been used in one clause of the Constitution is used in another, it must be understood as retaining the sense originally given to it. Therefore, when the Constitution first empowers Congress to provide for the organizing, arming, and disciplining of the militia, and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, the militia and them must refer to the militia in the Constitution's next relevant clause. namely, the militia of the several states, of which militia the president shall be commander-in-chief, when they are called into the actual service of the United States. And these militia of the several states must be the very same well-regulated militia necessary to the security of a free state of which the Second Amendment then speaks. If only because each and every state in the Union, that is, the several states, as the Constitution always describes them collectively, must be taken to be a free state within the amendment's understanding of that term. So, the militia of the several states that Congress is empowered to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining must also be understood as consisting of the people as a whole in each of those states. Furthermore, the people, with respect to whom the Second Amendment commands that the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, must be the self-same we the people who do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. For nothing in the Constitution or any of its amendments identifies any other people as entitled to any rights, powers, privileges, or immunities. In addition, because the Constitution itself nowhere creates the militia of the several states, or authorizes the states or Congress to do so, it recognizes the militia in the selfsame way it treats the several states themselves, as establishments that pre-existed its ratification that it incorporated in the form which it found them, and for the function they performed at that time, and that it presumes will continue in that form and for that function into the indefinite future. Finally, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this Union a Republican form of government. The Constitution does not expressly define a Republican form, but it also does not, cannot, leave that definition to the general government either. To the contrary, the Constitution treats the militia of the several states as perpetual in existence and permanent in authority and character. Therefore, because each of the several states must maintain her own militia, and because every state in this union must be guaranteed a republican form of government, then simply per force of constitutional logic, a republican form must encompass militia in every state per force of American history, too. In the scores of substantively identical military acts, militia acts, from the early 1600s through ratification of the Constitution in 1788. Every state government in America between 1776 and 1888 
was republican in form. Every colony in America prior to 1776 had established and maintained, as integral parts of their governmental structures, militia that had enrolled essentially every able-bodied free male in their jurisdictions. Therefore, such militia constitute an essential characteristic of a republican form of government. For such an unbroken legislative cavalcade provides unmistakable evidence of what was republican in form within the meaning of that term as employed within the Constitution. Therefore, all of the pre-constitutional colonial and state militia acts defined the necessary relationship between the militia and firearms by requiring every able-bodied adult free male personally to possess in his home suitable firearms, ammunition, and necessary accoutrements, and to bear them abroad whenever needful for military service. Therefore, a republican form of government must protect the right of individuals and even impose on them the duty to keep and bear arms at least to that degree and in that manner. Moreover, this right and duty must be universal and absolute, for the United States cannot infringe upon them if they are to guarantee to every state in this Union a republican form of government, as the Constitution commands. And no state can infringe upon them either if she is to retain her own republican form, as the Constitution requires that she must. Rather, the United States must affirmatively promote the right and duty of common Americans to keep and bear arms, not only through positive exercise of the power and fulfillment of the duty of Congress to provide for arming the militia, but also through negative legislative, executive, and judicial checks by the general government on any attempts by the states to disarm their citizens. The states, too, must affirmatively promote the right and duty of common Americans to keep and bear arms, as well as avoiding any action of their own that smacks of disarmament, while resisting all such actions on the part of the general government. Not surprisingly, with a document as intentionally consistent as the Constitution, the self-same conclusion follows by commencing inquiry with the Second Amendment. The amendment declares both as a matter of historical fact, based on generations of experience in every colony and independent state, and as a foundational principle of constitutional law, that well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state, and therefore that a free state, capable of survival as such, must have a well-regulated militia. The amendment also presumes that each of the several states is and must continue to be a free state, and therefore that each of them must always maintain a militia, for which purpose the original Constitution already furnishes a means, in the power and duty of Congress, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia. Furthermore, because the United States shall guarantee to every state in the Union a republican form of government, a free state in the American constitutional constellation must have or be of a republican form. Indeed, effectively the two appellations must refer to essentially the same thing. So, because a necessary attribute of a free state in America is a well-regulated militia, that must be a defining characteristic of a republican form of government here too. To the founding fathers, a well-regulated militia was organized, armed, disciplined, trained, and governed according to the precepts and practices of the pre-constitutional colonial and state militia acts. For the militia under those acts, were the only ones the fathers knew, and in which most of them had actually served. 
in every colony and state, the pre-constitutional militia were always composed of the main body of the inhabitants, in the persons of every able-bodied free male not statutorily exempted, all of whom enjoyed and exercised a right and fulfilled a legally enforceable duty personally to possess suitable firearms, ammunition, and necessary accoutrements in their own homes, and to bear them abroad whenever requisite for militia service. That being so, on that legal, historical understanding, not only must the right of the people to keep and bear arms not be infringed by either the states or the United States per force of the Second Amendment, but also the United States must guarantee that right specifically as it relates to the militia, and must see as well to the enforcement of the corresponding duty of the people to keep and bear arms in every state in this Union as part and parcel of maintaining a republican form of government there. End of chapter 2